What up guys, coming at you with another AMA this week. We got a new little setup going on. I was just like, let's just kind of move. We're in the next room. You can see some surfboards behind me, a drum set. It's kind of cool. Let me know what you think below. But yeah, we got the new setup. We just restocked the electrolytes on Amazon. We restocked the grass-fed, grass-finished whey protein, the beef isolate protein. A lot of people ask me which protein they should use. If you're going for more of a gut, skin, nourishing protein, go with the beef isolate. If you want an affordable muscle-building protein, go with the grass-fed whey. So let's jump into this week's AMA. You've left a lot of questions below. I appreciate that. Keep on leaving your questions and I will get to them. Let's dive in, let's answer some questions. This question is, Brendan, what are your thoughts on having an organic cigar with the boys? Okay, so I'm assuming you do this occasionally. So this isn't like a thing you do often. What do I mean by that? This better not be something that you do every week. This better not be something that you even do two, three times a month. I'm talking, if you do this maybe once every other month, I think it's okay. You're probably not going to get mouth or jaw cancer from that. The thing is, people have really fallen into this trap of believing that cigars, for some reason, like increase their testosterone massively. Look, you can have a short-term spike in testosterone from doing many things. I can go chop wood in the backyard, have a massive short-term spike in testosterone. You should not worry about things that cause a short-term spike in testosterone. Literally, uh, punching one of your boys in the face next to you would cause a massive increase in your testosterone. You're not just going to do stuff because of that. Cigars have health risks. Tobacco has health risks. You can get jaw cancer if you do that too much. Literally mouth cancer. They have to saw your jaw off. Occasional thing, once in a blue moon, sure, totally fine. You're doing it often, not good for you. The next question is, Brennan, do you think chicken stock is a good replacement for bone broth? So bone broth is actually more nutrient dense. It's going to have more of that glycine, more of those micronutrients. Chicken stock is very similar to bone broth, but first of all, if you're using beef bone broth versus chicken stock, I'm going with the beef bone broth all day. Now, of course, certain recipes you're going to want to use chicken stock, right? It's totally fine. It's not like a void of nutrients or anything like that, but you're going to get more glycine, more collagen, more protein overall with bone broth. The next question is, Brendan, what are your thoughts on Zins? The Zinni pouches, the lip pillows. Look, guys, these things are horrible for you. This is big tobacco putting more nicotine in your system. Now, of course, yeah, there's some studies showing nicotine can help your mental focus. Yeah, totally. You take one of those Zins, you might feel focused, you might feel good. The other ingredients in there are horrible. They are known to lead to cancer, to be carcinogenic. It's so stupid that people have fallen into this trap of thinking that just because they're using a smokeless tobacco product, smokeless nicotine pouches, that somehow they're good. It's not. I've done a post on this. I'll do more info on this, but there are tons of studies showing that nicotine orally is not good for you. And it, yeah, it might not be the nicotine, but it's the other ingredients in there. It's not just nicotine in there, guys. There's acesulfame potassium. There's tons of preservatives. There's other harmful ingredients in there. Don't do those. The next question is beetroot extract, a natural way to lower blood pressure. So beetroot extract has gotten very popular because it helps those nitric oxide pathways that your body has. Much like L-arginine or L-citrulline, beetroot powder acts on the same receptors and even like uh, teledafinil and all those things, which I don't really use. I'm not too much into that, but I would go with L-citrulline instead of beetroot powder and other ingredients like vasodrive AP. Here's why. Beetroot powder is going to be very rich in oxalic acid. You've heard Paul Saladino talk about oxalates as this anti-nutrient you should fear. I'm not fully in that camp of you should totally avoid oxalates. It's impossible, first of all. Like fruit has oxalates. However, beetroot powder and the beetroot extracts are pretty damn high in them. If you're doing those every day, like pre-workout, that's a bad idea. Look for a product with citrulline, vasodrive AP, methyl B12. We're releasing one soon. Uh, might be out uh, mid-November. So that's what we're working on for blood flow because increasing nitric oxide is great in many ways. I wouldn't do it with beetroot powder, especially too often. The next question is, Brendan, why are canola and rapeseed oil bad for you if they have a good omega-3 to omega-6 ratio? So what's going on there is those omega-3 fatty acids get oxidized. These oils are exposed to light. They're very fragile. They sit in stores in these giant plastic vats, or they're used in restaurants, and they are reusing those oils over and over again. If you are trying to compare cold-pressed canola oil to what you're actually consuming, what the population is actually consuming, you're not comparing the same things. I'm not one of these people that genuinely thinks that seed oils, if you consume them sometimes, are going to ruin your health. I'll go eat chipotle that has seed oils in it. I was just in Mexico City. I was eating out at restaurants. They're cooking with seed oils. I don't think it's like, poof, your health is done if you eat seed oils sometimes. However, it is clear to me that eating fats that have been around forever and are not easily oxidized, like olive oil packaged in a nice amber glass, beef tallow, coconut oil, butter, ghee, 
These fats are better for you. They are more stable, and we have seen throughout human history, this is what human beings have consumed. I know there are meta-analysis showing that seed oils are good. You can make a study showing anything. I'm going to keep on avoiding them. I'm not going to be so fearful of them that I'm freaking out. It's kind of funny to hate on seed oils, though. Keep on doing it. But yeah, I'm good off that canola and rapeseed oil. No thank you. The next question is, Brendan, is an electric stove a better option health-wise than a gas stove? So there are some studies showing that gas stoves can potentially be detrimental to your lung health. However, I love my gas stove. Now, do I think an electric stove might be better in terms of the pollutants that it might put into the air? Yes, I think there are some solid research studies on that. However, what I do is I open a window and a door when I use my gas stove, sort of filtering out some of the air. The gas stove just cooks stuff better. Ask any chef, they want that real gas stove. I don't think it's a major driver of health. It's so funny that this went so viral and we even have politicians talking about banning gas stoves and houses. This is a relatively minor thing. Why are you not thinking about what people are cooking on their stoves? Why as a politician, you don't talk about that. You don't talk about what you're feeding kids for lunch, for breakfast. You don't talk about how 20% of kids are obese from the corporations that you probably get money from. And it's bullshit. It's like you want to focus on removing gas stoves from Americans' houses. I'm not a fan of that at all. I am an American. I'm a taxpaying citizen. If I want a gas stove in my house, I'm going to put a gas stove in my house. It's ridiculous. Um, I don't think they should be banned. I think that's crazy. Let me know below what you think. The next question is, Brendan, what are your thoughts on Jocko Fuel? So Jocko, obviously a really good guy. Um, I think he's doing great things for health and wellness. Former uh, military member, obviously. Savage in jiu-jitsu, black belt. Amazing guy. He's released this line of products, which I think are overall pretty good. However, what I will say is like in his electrolytes, for example, you will have cane sugar in there, processed sugar. Some of the ingredients in his protein powder, I'm not a big fan of. Does this mean it's a horrible product and you shouldn't buy it? No, not at all. If you like it, that's totally fine. I think what we make is better and it has way less processed ingredients. We don't have processed sugar in our products. So I think it's a pretty decent product, better than, you know, a lot of stuff you're going to find on the shelves. A little overpriced. Definitely some additives, some processed sugar in the electrolytes. I would go Santa Cruz Paleo. The next question is, Brennan, what is your philosophy on training hard versus longevity? And this is a really good question because it appears there is some balance in many things of longevity research and stuff that I like to do, like hard training, eating a lot of protein and meat. Here is, I'm, think, I'm glad you asked this question because here's the deal, guys. There is research showing that you can do like a severe calorie deficit, not train hard, and you might be able to live longer. I'm not into that shit. I don't want to do that. I don't care if I die at age 90 something, if I've lived a full life eating steaks and training hard and doing cool stuff. I try to keep longevity in my body by staying injury free and not heavily overtraining. I am careful week to week about, you know, balancing training in my immune function. If you overtrain, if I just did the workout that I did yesterday, every single day this week, I would eventually get run down and sick, might accrue some injuries, just be having a high level of, you know, C-reactive protein and other inflammatory markers in my body that are caused by overtraining. So I do try to have that balance and give myself plenty of rest. However, look, when I see this research showing that, hey, oh, you can uh, completely avoid eating red meat and it might add a few years to your life. What about vitality in those years? I want to be 85 years old and have vitality. I do not care about much of this longevity research. I'm into it. I watch all the stuff from David Sinclair and people like that, but look at David Sinclair, bro. He's an extremely frail man because he's probably doing that calorie deficit thing to try to add you know, a couple years to his longevity. I don't want to do that. Let me know your thoughts below, guys. I mean, uh, look, I want to live a long life. I know I'm going to live a long, healthy life, but I don't want to try to reach 103 years old if those last 10 years I'm like extremely frail and freaking out over stuff. No, I'm going to be a savage up until I'm 90. And then if I die, then it's fine. The next question is, Brendan, are you going to go to Miami and visit Aiden Ross? So Aiden reacted to two of my videos saying he wants to have me out and help him dial in his health which I love because I can totally make him a healthier human being and adapt it to his lifestyle. I'm not going to come in there and be like, stop streaming, bro. Like, no, no. I adapt stuff to people's lifestyle and I can certainly help him achieve his best health, dial in his sleep, dial in his nutrition, all that. His manager reached out and said, we're going to make something happen. I followed up with him. I'm waiting on the response from them. So, you know, tag in Ross, put this in his discord, all that type of stuff. I can get out there to Miami anytime, help him dial in his health, all that. And yeah, I, I want to see the dude healthy. And I think he has a big audience of young folks 
who need to hear this information. A lot of the influencers that you guys are making famous are putting out some pretty poor messages and showing a lifestyle that, yeah, it's cool, man. Do that when you're 17, 18. Get back to me when you're 26 years old and you're living that lifestyle. You're going to want to be healthy. Health as well. The next question is, Brendan, I play football and I'm wondering your thoughts on the health concerns about playing football. I'm assuming you're talking about head trauma. So unfortunately, this is, I just have to be factual about this. You know, um, I like, I promote sort of two different messages here. So it's tough. I want you to be a savage and take risks and do stuff. Don't be afraid. If you want to play football and you enjoy it, do it. If you want to do boxing and you enjoy it, do it. If you want to train MMA and you you that's what you want to do, go do it. However, you should be informed about the risks. Getting hit in the head over and over again is not good for your brain health. Some people do have a genetic disposition to take more damage from head trauma, and you can look into that. Google head trauma gene, and maybe you can go get tested for that gene. If you have it, you should really stay away from getting hit in the head. Look, there are people that played football their whole lives and done MMA and boxing their whole lives that are totally fine mentally. There's also a lot of people who aren't. I don't know, man. I mean... I would do it, you know, if you enjoy football and that's something you like to do, I would do it. I would be aware of the risks, but you can't just like live your life based off risk, right? Now, I'm older right now. I'm like, I'm not going to take up boxing or MMA and go get hit in the head. I feel like I can get all that from jujitsu, you know what I mean? Obviously, I'm not going to be able to spar with people in boxing and stuff like that. I'll still hit the heavy bag. But that's a calculation I'm making. I'm going, okay, that sport's really cool. I like it. I don't want to get hit in the head because it's bad for you. I'm going to train another martial art. So make informed risks, but yeah, do what you want to do. The next question is, Brennan, I'm 19 and balding. I'm losing my hair. What can I do? So there are actually some things you can do. First of all, when we look at diet, we can see studies showing that taurine loss, for example, like if you're not getting enough taurine, there's other nutrients too, but there's a great study I just read about taurine and hair loss. Uh, it's a nutrient found in red meat. So first of all, get the diet dialed in. If your body's not getting adequate nutrition, your body's not going to function properly. So diet and sleep, you need to dial those in first. Now, there are studies that showing topical um, minoxidil, and now recently rosemary oil is a more natural one that you can use. My buddy Lance just came out with a product called the Super Serum from Base Body Works that has some of those DHT blocking ingredients in them. You can get that and put it into your scalp and sort of rub it in, see what he says about it for like exact use. But basically what you want to do is block some of that DHT in the scalp. I would not go the finasteride route, which is blocking DHT in your body. I do not think the risk reward there is worth it. You're telling me you want to block your dihydrotestosterone in order to grow more hair? Well, dude, you're going to have maybe some more hair, but you're not going to be able to get your hard. You know what I mean? Like that's not a risk I'm willing to take. Dihydrotestosterone is crucial in the body for being a man. Um, so I wouldn't block it internally, but if you want to use some of that rosemary oil or other topicals, you should start that now. Um, I know they're doing some pretty crazy stuff with surgery on, on the hair right now, so you could look into that. But yeah, diet and use some of those topical DHT blockers, see how that works. The next question is, Brennan, should I put gel in my hair or should I let it be natural? So in my opinion, you should not put gel into your hair. I've seen the ingredients in some of those gels, the hair gels. Just looked a lot of them up. They're horrible. Uh, I haven't found one that has good ingredients. What you can get is a texture powder. Um, dude, I'm just putting on Lance this episode. What is going on? But like he did two questions about hair. He did just release a texture powder where it's silica and mica, which are clays and, and silica is a mineral. I have that in my bathroom. And like basically like if I don't surf for a while, I feel like uh, like what if I surf, I get that natural like sea salt texture hair to my uh, to my look to my hair. But uh, if you use that texture powder, you just do like two or three sprays of it. And it's just like this powder and it gives a lot of texture and body to your hair. That's what I would use instead of a gel. I would not be relying on a gel every day. It's going to go into your scalp, going to go into your skin, going to go into your body. If you use that daily, that could provide some endocrine disrupting uh, bad effects. The next question is, Brennan, what are your thoughts on soaked Brazil nuts and cashews for magnesium intake? So we see that uh, nuts have a decent amount of magnesium. What do I think about that? You know, Brazil nuts became very popular because just two Brazil nuts will give you your daily dose of selenium that you need. The problem with nuts is they do have a lot of anti-nutrients. If you're eating a small amount of cashews and Brazil nuts and you're doing that for kind of like a multi-mineral type vibe, that's totally fine. Um, I think that's going to be okay. However, I just prefer to take magnesium glycinate because I don't like a lot of the anti-nutrients in nuts. Doesn't mean I never eat them. I'm totally down to use them in some recipes, whatever. But if you're doing that daily to get your minerals in, not a big fan of that. You can get all your minerals in through a diet. I understand that magnesium is hard to get in. Trust me, I understand. I have a magnesium supplement. So if you get the Santa Cruz Paleo Magnesium Caps, you could take two to three of those in the evening. You're going to get plenty of magnesium that way. 
Magnesium is a bit difficult to get through diet and people ask why. It used to be in our water. If you go to a natural spring and you fill up, you know, a thing of water from there, it's going to have a good amount of magnesium. Also, the soil used to have more magnesium, so the food we ate used to have more magnesium. People will ask this because they'll be like, well, we should be able to get everything through diet. And it's somewhat true, but when our soil's depleted and your water's depleted, you might need to look towards supplementation. The next question is, Brennan, why do I still have acne? I eat very clean and I take care of myself. So first of all, if you are a teenager, a little bit of acne can be normal. What do I mean by this? If you're having hormone fluctuations and you live in the modern world where you're exposed to a lot of toxins, you might have a little bit of acne. However, if you have constant acne, there is something wrong with your health. What I would do if you are having this issue is get a gut test and a hormone test. You need to look on your own in terms of what that exactly means, but I'm telling you right now, there are gut panels and there are hormone panels, and you need to work with somebody to interpret these results. Your normal doctor doesn't know shit about this, unless you have a really good doctor. If you go to them and you say, here's my hormone panel, they're gonna look at it and go, cool, yeah, you're good. No, you need to find somebody who really knows their stuff about this. Some common supplements that can probably help with this are, there's one called DIM. Uh, DIM basically helps your hormone system bounce testosterone to estrogen. And in your environment, there's probably a lot of estrogen uh, stuff going on, whatever that is. Um, you know, toxic fumes at your school, there could be mold. I don't know what's going on with you. Uh, vitamin B5 is another one. There are some good studies on vitamin B5 and acne. So you should look into that. Sleep is another thing. If you aren't getting eight to nine hours a night of good sleep, you need to look into that. Those are some things that can help right there, but you might need to get some lab tests done. The next question is, Brennan, do you enjoy everyday life and are you genuinely a happy person? So my answer on this is a bit complex. The answer is yes, I am a happy person. However, you watching this right now and me talking right now, being a human being doesn't mean being happy all the time. Nobody is wired that way. When you look at our evolution, if you were happy with your environment all the time, you would die. For 99.9% .9 of the time we've been on earth, we needed to struggle. We needed to constantly come up with ways to survive every single day, every hour, every minute. That is still deeply ingrained into our brains. So if you are just constantly happier, if you're even trying to search for constant happiness, you are going down a road that isn't true, brother. It's not there. No human being is ever constantly happy. Am I a generally happy person? Absolutely. I wake up very stoked. I have activities I like. I have people in my life that I really like. I have money. I have businesses. I have cool toys. I have surfboards and cars. And I'm loving life right now 100%. However, I feel like when a lot of people get to this state or they get to some state where they're like, I'm supposed to get to here. If I make this amount of money and I have this stuff, I'll be super happy all the time. That's never the goal. And if you know, like I know that's never the goal, so it makes me more happy, if you understand what I'm saying. If you are trying to achieve permanent happiness, it's never there. You should have a deep sense of gratitude. You should have a deep sense of being stress-free and not letting things in your life aggravate you. But pure happiness isn't who we are as human beings. You want to always be working on something, thinking, plotting your next move. Never stay stagnant. The next question is, Brennan, do I need a reverse osmosis system if I live in Norway? Apparently, Norway has the second best tap water in the world, is what he's saying. I've actually been to Norway. I went to Oslo when I was uh, younger, when I was like 12 years old. And I will say, your tap water out there is probably pretty, pretty good. Very clean area. What I would do is maybe get a water filter of some sort. You might not need a reverse osmosis. If there are no pathogens in your water, bacteria, pharmaceuticals, birth control like we have in the United States, then you might be good. I would be concerned about the piping. A lot of this piping that brings the water into your house is very old, so there could be some lead or copper or aluminum contamination. That's pretty common. So you could still benefit from a reverse osmosis system and then uh, adding in some minerals through electrolytes or sea salt. So you could go for it, but you're probably pretty good with tap water out there. The next question is, Brennan, for sports when you aren't sweating, like this dude's talking about doing some Nordic skiing. So he's definitely putting a lot of exertion out, but he's not sweating. So what he's wondering is, do you want to do a more sugar-based drink or a salt-based drink before that? So your body uses minerals to create an energy system, okay? You stay hydrated through water and minerals, whether you're sweating or not. When you sweat, you are going to excrete more sodium, potassium, and magnesium. However, what people need to understand is sweating doesn't mean dripping sweat. When you are going skiing or snowboarding, even though it's cold, you still are sweating. You just don't notice it as much because it's a different type of sweat. You are still losing fluid. So what I would do is you could do both, man. 
If you wanted to have some fruit juice because you're going to burn off tons of energy or something like that, or maybe some fruit and a salt-based electrolyte, that is what I would do. And in fact, I do that. When I'm about to go snowboard for a long time, I'm having our electrolytes. I usually keep them in a camelback on my back while I'm snowboarding. And I might have some fruit before I go out there. Some bananas, some oranges, some apples, whatever it is, some honey. So I would do both. The next question is, Brennan, what are your thoughts on the Blue Zone documentary? So this documentary came out on Netflix, basically promoting that the Blue Zones are plant-based and basically pushing a vegetarian diet. It is so dumb to see. It's really, really stupid. And if you just want two examples right here, we can run through them. Okay, I lived in a blue zone. How about that? I lived in the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica for about a month and a half when I was younger. This is one of the blue zones. They eat fish, meat, and eggs. Do they eat tons of them? No, they don't. They eat a moderate amount of fish, meat, and eggs. They also use butter. They also don't use seed oils. So this Blue Zone documentary conveni conveniently leaves out a lot of stuff basically to push people towards this plant-based vegetarian agenda. And it's just not true. Go to Sardina, Italy. This is one of the areas that is a Blue Zone. Go there and tell people you are vegetarian and you don't eat fish and you don't eat cheese. They are going to slap you. They eat a lot of fish there. They eat a lot of seafood. They eat a lot of cheese. They use butter. They use olive oil. They don't use seed oils. I think what we should learn from the Blue Zones is this. If you eat unprocessed food and you eat a variety of foods and you have a good community and you have good physical activity and low stress, you're going to live a pretty long time. Now, do I think if they examined a group of people like me who ate, you know, good amount of grass-fed beef, eggs, worked out and had good community, had good relationships, had low stress, what do you think those people are going to be like? I think we're going to do pretty damn well, okay? We're going to be our own little blue zone. So there's various things that work for health and longevity, and I think that's what the Blue Zones show. If somehow you are falling into the trap of going plant-based because of the Blue Zones, then go to some of the Blue Zones and tell them you only eat plants. See how that goes for you. The next question is, Brennan, what do you think about beers without alcohol? Um, I think they're stupid. I would not consume that. I know you're trying to not drink, maybe. Um, it's not going to be good for your gut health. First of all, a lot of those beers have gluten, so you're basically drinking gluten. A lot of them have natural sugars through and fermentation. It's really going to throw off your gut. Uh, you're talking about fermenting, you know, wheat, hops, barley, corn, rye. It depends on which one you're drinking there. Not good for you at all. I'm sorry, man. Don't drink them. The next question is, Brendan, do you recommend putting protein powder in milk or water? I personally like putting it in milk. I get some good full-fat grass-fed milk, and I like to throw a scoop of my protein in there. That's what I prefer. I know for some people, if they're trying to do it pre-workout, they might want to do water. That's totally fine. I would go with our grass-fed, grass-finished whey if that's what you're going to do because it mixes in really well. Beef isolate protein is so gelatinous, very rich in collagen that you really do need to blend it in. But if you want a protein that just mixes in like a shaker bottle, go with the grass-fed whey. The next question is, Brennan, what are your thoughts on natural flavors? So natural flavors are this thing that a lot of people in the holistic health community hate on. We'll see Bobby, Flav City do all these videos going, this is natural flavors, this is bad. And you know what, man? Probably about 10 years ago, I used to think the same thing. I was sketched out about natural flavors because I saw an article basically saying that they are artificial, that they the companies don't have to release these recipes so they can be anything in there. That's not true. Now, if a company is breaking the rules and putting artificial flavors in there, I mean, that's one problem. However, we source our natural flavors from a company that really only has like 20 options because they use actual natural flavors. They don't have that many options. These are made from the essential oils from plants, fruits, natural substances. Now you're saying, well, why don't they tell us why don't they tell us what's exactly in there? The reason is the ingredient roster of natural flavors, because I've seen it, would be like it has this much peppermint, like for a peppermint, for uh, let's use a flavor that we use, lemon lime. It's not just a little bit of lime oil and a little bit of lemon oil. There might be a little bit of yuzu citrus in there. There might be a little bit of pineapple in there to create that actual like lemon lime flavor that we're going for. If they release what is exactly in there, people, we would copy it. We literally would copy it because then we don't have to use that company. So that is why they are approved to just put natural flavors. They are FDA regulated to be natural. They can't put artificial ingredients in there. So I'm not against natural flavors at all. There isn't one study showing that they're bad for your health in any way, shape, or form. I'm not against them at all. I consume them every single day, and I trust the natural flavors that we put into our products, obviously. Uh, I'll do more posts on that. You, you've probably seen Rob LaFam, the scientist, do some videos on natural flavors. They're not something to worry about. 
at all. All right, guys, that is it for this week's AMA. Let me know what you think of the setup. Of course, go to santacruzpaleo.com. Use the code SANTACRUZ10 at checkout. Any two items you buy, you'll save 10%. And yeah, just like leave your questions below. Show love, subscribe, share this with your friends, all that type of stuff. I appreciate you guys. Peace.